Devora, to please take over from here. Hi, everybody. So nice to see everybody. It is such a treat to be doing our annual um, Abraham Pilchik lecture. And I want to give a tremendous thank you to the Menches, Paula and David Mensch. This is really an honor that we can do this every single year and nothing's going to stop us. We're doing it on Zoom this year um, in honor of your father. And I look forward to hearing about him um, in a moment. So, but thank you. Thank you for sponsoring and thank you for being um, the reason that we're all here together tonight and we're going to gain so much. Um, I want to thank Stella Vinkovich for uh, cheering this, for connecting us with the great judge, making it all happen. And you will hear from her shortly as she will be the one interviewing and introducing us to the judge so we can hear everything we need to hear. So, um, Again, so good to see you all. I'm so excited to hear everything that tonight has to offer. And I'm now gonna pass over the Zoom floor to Mrs. Mensch so we can hear about your dear father. I hope this brings him a lot of joy and nachas and he should continue to be um, a conduit for you and your family and we should be reunited with Mashiach right now. Amazing. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Devora. And, uh, Thank you, Devora and Yeye, for organizing the fifth annual Chabad Young Professionals Lecture in memory of my father, Abraham Pelchik of blessed memory. Unfortunately, because of COVID, this year's event is on Zoom, but God willing, next year, our family will be able to once again host all of you in person. My father had so many stellar qualities, but rather than be repetitive each year, I try to relate some of them to the topic or the speaker of the evening. This year, we are privileged to have the Honorable Ruffy Fryer, who amongst her many accomplishments, can count the groundbreaking fact that she is the first Hasidic Jewish woman to be elected as a civil court judge in New York State. In addition, as if that was not enough, she is also the first Hasidic woman in United States history to hold a public office. I have spoken often in the past of my father as a Holocaust survivor, a husband, a community leader, and Baal Tzedakah. But this year, I'd like to tell you a story that is more personal in nature and relates to my relationship with him. Judge Fryer, I took the liberty of watching your interview with Megan Kelly, in which you stated that your husband is your biggest supporter. You said, and I quote, people make a big deal about me being the first Hasidic woman judge, but I think the bigger deal is my husband being the first Hasidic man that allowed his wife to run for public office and supported my campaign. I can certainly relate to the fact that your husband is your biggest supporter, as I feel that my husband has always been mine over these last 45 years. However, my dad and I had a professional working relationship, one in which he always had my back and his belief in me, not only as a daughter, but as a professional woman, gave me the confidence to succeed in an industry which at the time employed only a handful of women. My dad had business dealings, which often included people from all over the globe. I was 22 and had only been working with him for a short time when a gentleman, one of his international clients, entered his office. My dad introduced me and said I would be handling his account, whereupon the client stated that he would only do business with my father and not a woman, let alone a young girl to which my father in no uncertain terms replied, you have a choice. You can do business with my daughter or I can show you the door. That memorable moment has stuck with me until today. My father in his own way was a champion of women's rights. He lived by a code of ethics that measured people only according to their abilities and not according to their gender. As a matter of fact, the story goes that when I was born and the doctor approached my dad in the waiting room, because in those days, husbands were not even allowed in the delivery room, the doctor apologized and said, I'm sorry, it's another girl. To which my dad replied, you mean now I can say I have a girl and a girl? How wonderful. 
If my dad were here today, his humility would prevent me from telling you that he was by nature a very just and fair-minded individual. His office, though not a judge's chamber, was so often a safe haven where I witnessed countless friends, business people, relations, and congregants who came for advice on how to settle their disputes. On that note, I would like to introduce Judge Ruthie Fryer, a trailblazer, a problem solver, and a role model to women in all walks of life. She is someone whose ship of outstanding accomplishments has sails that are always driven by the winds of God. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Hi, yes. Hey, Judge Breyer, we hear you. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Mrs. Mensch, thank you for um, your, your words and for making this lecture series possible. And although we can't be together in person tonight, I certainly feel the overwhelming love and light of this community. Um, you know, when I advertised this event, I talked about Judge Freyer, how I saw you speak at my firm, uh, a very secular financial services firm. I usually don't tune into the series. And when I saw that a Hasidic female judge is coming on, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm showing up. And, you know, I sat back and I saw you interviewed by Eric Cantor. I'm, I'm not sure if everyone on the, the Zoom knows who Eric Cantor is. He was the former Speaker of the House. And I just thought like, wow, what an incredible moment. And I have to replicate this magic on, um, in, in the Upper East Side in our young professionals community. So I'm so thrilled that we can make this happen. Um, and I, I think we're gonna have an incredible conversation. And so I wanna kick it off by saying, you know, um, Mrs. Mensch teed up such an introduction for you. And I, of course, widely advertise this event alongside the community, but I actually really just want you to introduce yourself and tell mm -hmm. the audience how we got to the point where you ended up as the first Hasidic woman to hold public office in your own so, case. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's an honor to be, to, be, to be here, to be a guest at the series and to be speaking to such a wonderful group of people and, and in, in honor of such a wonderful person, um, you know, who I just heard the introduction as I, as I logged on. So I come from really very humble background. I come from a very average Hasidic family. I grew up in Borough Park. I'm the oldest of five children. My parents weren't wealthy. They weren't politically connected or rabbinically connected, just hardworking, real sincere parents. And one of the things that my parents were so incredible in, in, in doing to not just me, but to all of my siblings, is to make us feel that we were great, we were wonderful. And um, they each had their own, you know, points that were important. My mother raised us telling us, girls, you could do whatever you want to do, so long as it isn't illegal, immoral, or against the Torah. And my father, to him, Derek Eretz, character, um, how we behave, that was most important. So I grew up knowing that there were certain things that were expected of me, but I also knew that the world was wide open with opportunities. Never did I feel that I was stifled. Never did I feel that there was something that I wanted to do that I couldn't do. I knew that there were rules, but I basically knew that the world was wide open with opportunity. I also went to a very um, ultra orthodox girls school called Beis Yaakov. Mm -hmm. And my teachers impressed upon us that we were all created in the image of God, which meant that we had incredible potential. So having all that in my background and also being the oldest grandchild of Holocaust survivors, which in and of itself, my generation was very unique because we proved that Hitler, may his name be obliterated, um, that he was wrong. Not only did the Jewish nation survive, not only were there Holocaust survivors, not only were there children, but now there were grandchildren. So I'm Yisrael Chaivikayam. My generation, we had to just go to school sit there and just breathe, you know, inhale oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide, and we were just wonderful. Now, having said that, I also grew up in a generation where Hasidic girls were not expected to go beyond high school in terms of a secular education. And I was not going to be a rebel. I was going to conform to the community standards, but I wanted to make money. And, um, 
I wanted to be able to support a, a husband who was going to sit and study the Talmud in a kollel. So I wanted to be able to support him. And at that time, my high school gave a course called legal stenography, which prepared us to be legal secretaries. And I took the course and I got a job. I was 17 years old when I, gra- 17 years old when I graduated. And that's when I got my first job. And it wasn't until I turned 30 when I realized the secretary is just not enough for me anymore. And that's when I embarked on my path of higher education. But for me, what was so important, and that's really one of the reasons why I think it's important for me to share my story, is I had a unique challenge. And my challenge was, I was told by all the naysayers, and trust me, when you want to do something that's important or something that's great, you're always going to have naysayers. And the naysayers all had predicted that if I was going to go on the path of higher education, I will not be as committed to my Hasidic traditions, to my values, and I ultimately would let go more and more of my Hasidic values. So for me, what was so important was that I needed to prove that the two worlds, the Hasidic world and the, 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 the outside secular world, the corporate world, the legal world, that these two worlds were not mutually exclusive, that I would be able to combine them. But I knew I had to forge my own path. I didn't think I had any role models. And that's really basically the gist of my story. So I, I'm so grateful for my background. And in fact, it was just the opposite of what the naysayers had said. The further I traveled and the higher I, I climbed, the more I appreciated my background. I would come home from Manhattan, get off the subway and say, thank God this is where I live. It didn't stop me from wanting to go higher and higher, but it made me appreciate what so many people in my community just take for granted. We're, we grew up this way, we're, we, we're just this is part of our life. We don't even think twice about so much of the things that we do. But I've learned to really appreciate it and not take it for granted. Um, so having said that, that's basically, I think, enough of an intro. Because if you don't stop me, I can keep on talking. So I, I know you have a list of questions. I know that your audience is a, is a professional one. So let's not, let, let's not you know, take away from them. Let me hear their questions. And let me focus on what I say that could be targeted to your professional, you know, incredible audience. Thank you, Judge, so much. So it's so interesting because I feel like you made this super easy for me because there are so many other stories that you didn't tell that now I get to ask you questions about. Okay. So, um, so you know, I was reading an article um, that was talking about a movie done on uh, this all-female EMS unit that you felt so passionately about starting. The, the documentary is called 93 Queen. And I know that that unit was then a big part of your political trajectory. Um, and you know, you, you broached on it because you spoke about the naysayers and boy, do I know that there were many naysayers when it came to you forming this unit. And so I'm wondering if you can kind of rewind the audience in time, tell us why you felt so passionately about having an all-female EMS unit and what the community's response was to that and, and you know, what were you thinking at the time? So truthfully, I wasn't thinking. It wasn't thinking, I was just like passion. It was just passion and a drive that I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't say no. So it all started with a group of women who had contacted me telling me that they were having a meeting at night they were a group of EMTs from the Hasidic community, and they were also trained as labor coaches, doulas, and that they wanted to know if I would meet with them because they wanted me to advocate for them. They wanted to serve. They wanted to volunteer. And in our neighborhood, there's only one volunteer EMS agency, which is very respected, around for 50 years, and they save thousands of lives. That's the Hatzalah organization. And Hatzalah is wonderful, but they just had one policy, which is they don't accept women in their ranks. So they'll treat women, they'll respond to calls for women, but if you want to join and you're a woman, you cannot join. And I never thought about this before. I grew up in Barra Park. I said, hey, never occurred to me that women would want to be part of this. So I went to meet them. Now you want to know, well, why did I agree to go meet with them? And then I have to rewind a little bit further. When I did make it to law school, now remember I started college when I was 30. 
College took me six years, and then I was going to start law school at the age of 36. At that point, I said to myself, the naysayers have been wrong until now, but now I'm going to be going into a very secular, academic, liberal environment. God, please help me. Please help me remain firm and committed to my Hasidic values to the next four years of law school. And God, if that happens and I become an attorney, when your children come to me for help, I will help them. And God wasted no time in testing me. Shortly after I graduated law school, I got involved in helping kids at risk, primarily young Hasidic boys in my neighborhood. And then came this group of women EMTs. And I said, I'm a lawyer and I need to do my research. I must get the evidence to make sure this is a need. And I interviewed women that had experiences of emergencies, primarily childbirth, and having their well-intentioned male neighbors come and assist them in, in labor. And the trauma just in them remembering what happened was just so apparent on their faces that I said, if I went to law school for this cause alone, it was worth it. Now, I didn't realize that I was going to have fierce opposition. I didn't realize how politically connected and strong this organization of EMTs was. And they went around saying, they went around saying, that this is part of Rachel, Rachel Fryer's radical feminist agenda. I'm sorry, but I have my emergency radio always with me. So if you hear some noise in the background, just don't worry about it. So I started to advocate for these women. And when the opposition came out against me, I said, I couldn't believe it. I, I was doing this for modesty. In Hebrew, the word is sneers. For women's modesty, which is such an important component in our way of life, especially in the Hasidic community, and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't understand why nobody else had the strength to fight this. And then I learned that for 30 years before me, people had tried, but they couldn't. They couldn't withstand the pressure and they let go. And then I said, this is not about women's rights. It's just that most of the time women are right especially when it comes to our medical care. Don't tell me that I can't become an EMT. And those men made a very big mistake. They pressed the wrong buttons. The worst thing to do was to tell me that I can't do something because I'm religious and Hasidic and a woman. Because if you tell me that, I'm going to prove to you that I can do it and maybe even better than you. And that's what I did. I took my mother with me. She's my best friend. We took Lamas together, the first course we took. My oldest child and my youngest brother are six weeks apart. I said, Ma, we did Lamas together. Let's go take the EMT course together. And I had to take it because I, by default, I became the director of this organization. And we, at the EMT course, I said to my mother, I said, Ma, this is amazing. I love this. Every class is interesting. What is boring? The heart, the brains, the lungs, the kidneys. Everything is amazing. I said, I have to go on and become a paramedic. And that's what I did. And it became so important. I mean, just today I was involved with, we were on the phone helping somebody because one of our volunteers went to a car crash. One went to a birth. I was taking care of an elderly woman who was having a different emergency. And people want us. Why take this away from us? So I feel so passionate about it. It's because I feel as a Hasidic woman, God created, created us with our special skills, with our Bina Yaseira, that special insight and intuition. And no one is going to tell me that our religion puts women down. And I would argue just the opposite. Judaism puts women on a pedestal. And that's what Ezra Nashim means to me, which is the name of the organization. That we are, we are created with incredible talents and skills, and we can help other women. And... Once I got involved, there was no turning back. And how the film 93 Queen came to be is another whole conversation. I could touch on it. If you'd like me to touch on it, it was um, when the filmmaker contacted me by email after we started to get some publicity. Everybody heard about the radical Hasidic feminist. And I kept saying, I'm not a radical Hasidic feminist, but it got me a lot of publicity. And she said to me, Ruchi, I'm a modern Orthodox filmmaker. And I, I'd love to do a film about your organization. And I said, no way. I said, I'm Hasidic. We don't, we don't, go to, we don't have television sets. We don't go to the movies, let alone, let alone be the subject of one. 
And then she convinced me by saying, Ruchi, she said, Hasidim have such a negative stereotype in, in the media. If I do this movie and you'll let me go into your home, it'll change the way people think about Hasidim, especially women. And I said to her, well, that's a real, that's a real high, high goal, but I won't take the risk. If the risk to my family is just too great. And then she says to me, but Ruchi, if we do this film, it'll sanctify God's name. There'll be a Kiddush Hashem. Uh, Kiddush Hashem, that's my soft spot. If I can do something that'll sanctify God's name, let's go to the rabbi. We went to my rabbi and we discussed it. We went to her rabbi and they said, it's not even a question. And according to Jewish law, it's about perspective. And if, you're, if you think you'll accomplish something good for Jewish women, then go for it. So that's how I got involved. That's why I became so passionate about it. And that's how the film came to be. So it was supposed to be three years, but it took five years. And my campaign happened to just happen during that time. God has a plan. You want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. So basically, that's how I got involved. And I am still involved. When I became a judge, I had to contact the Judicial Ethics Committee. Because any extracurricular activity that judges do has to be monitored for ethical concerns. And I, it was cleared. I'm able to do it. And, and I thank Hashem every day for this privilege. It's, it's incredible and it's an amazing opportunity just to see the divine providence, the siyata deshmaya that a person can have, an organization can have when you do something for the, name, for the sake of God. Thank you so much. First of all, I think you've all just given us the line of the night, which is that it's not about women's rights, it's that women are right. <laughs> So Most of the time. That's, <laughs> that's the headline. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's interesting that, you know, you shared the story of the EMS unit and you mentioned the opposition. But what I want to double click on is how that led to your political campaign for the bench and how the opposition ended up playing out. Because, you know, at that point, you were really combining worlds, right? You were... Um, you know, taking the political stage and placing a Hasidic woman in it. Um, and I know that that wasn't an easy journey for you. And I think that journey has a ton of commentary on what being a trailblazer actually means. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would love for you to talk about what really happened in that campaign. So my, my dream of being a judge was something that was just like a natural progression of my my advancement in the law. When I went to law school at that point, my uncle of blessed memory had been a judge. And I had watched him go from a law student when he married my mother's sister when I was a little girl to a, to a lawyer, to a, a law clerk and the judge himself. And I always told him, Duvi, I'd love to be a judge like you one day. And he said to me, one day he calls me up and, and I, he, he had become my mentor over the years. I spent time while I was doing my undergrad and during law school, sitting on the bench next to him and watching him. I never thought that I really would have that opportunity, but I always shared my dream with him. And then one day he calls me up and he says, Ruhi, I'm gonna be retiring soon. And if you still wanna be a judge, you're gonna to have to run for my original seat. And at that point, I didn't know if my family was ready for it. It was, I remember around sukkah's time and we were sitting in the sukkah and I come in serving the chicken soup. I tell my husband and my kids, you know, my uncle Dubi called me up and he said to me, if I want to be a judge, he's going to be retiring. I have to run for his original seat. Well, let me tell you, there was total silence in the sukkah. Everyone put their, their spoons down. And my husband takes a set up and he says, you want to be a judge? We'll get good health coverage. I think you should go for it. And if it wasn't for my husband's amazing support, there was no way I could have I could have succeeded. I mean, let's face it, ladies. As as you know, as ambitious as we are, and as creative, and as as much as we can be go getters, if we don't have the support of the men in our lives, it's going to be a real uphill battle. So my husband was has been there advocating for me. Um, going around campaigning for me, my kids were incredibly amazing. But I didn't realize 
that the two were going to be combined and actually collide. Because my, my, my dream to become a lawyer than a judge had always been with me. And then out of left field came EMS and Ezra Snashim. And when I announced that I wanted to run, my opponents who didn't want Ezra Snashim to be established, the men out there who felt that women should not be become EMTs, and even some of the women who felt that this is part of what the men do, we don't mix in, they actually opposed me when I was running for public office. And they got someone to run against me. And that's when the two collided. And I realized that when God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. And my mother, she's the smartest woman I know, said to me, Ruchi, don't worry. Don't worry if you don't have the political support that you want. Because when I wanted to run, I had to go to the party and get the party's nomination. But they said to me that they heard that a woman, a Hasidic woman, can never win in Borough Park. So I had to get myself on the ballot because I didn't have the party's nomination. My husband, my kids, my family, I had them go on all the street corners, getting signatures, getting me on the ballot. And that's how the two kind of crashed together. But I really felt that it was in the merit of the organization of all the work that I've done and the chesed that all the women have done together with me is really what helped me get and achieve this position. It was, it was just God's blessing. I, I, I love my job and, and I consider it an honor to be able to serve in this capacity. And um, if anybody does get to watch the film 93 Queen, there's one scene where people ask me what I meant when I said, and you, there's a scene, and there's a lot of footage in my home. And at one point, you see me cooking or cleaning the kitchen counter. And I'm saying, you know, had God created me as a man, it would have been so much easier. And what I meant by that was God doesn't make mistakes. If God created me as a woman and put all these desires and ambition in me as a woman, that meant it was okay for me to do it. And I was going to go with it. And I wasn't going to let people stop me because I did discuss it with my rabbi. And I did have the support of the rabbis. So I just had to go and do it. But I had to find my way. And, and that's really the gist of what I have to say. Is that we all have dreams. We all have ambition. We all have things that we want to do. And when you want to do something, the higher your goal the more you're going to naysayers are going to come and tell you it's not possible. But you can't let that stop you. You have to have that faith and that belief that God runs the world. And if you want something to happen, it's going to happen. You just have to try. So going forward and achieving my goal, that was one thing. On the other hand, I, to me, what was also super important was that the standards that I have as a Hasidic woman, woman, I wasn't going to compromise them. And what I've learned, and I want to share with everybody who wants to listen, is that we all have our own standards. And we're all different, and God created us different. We can be Ashkenazic, Sephardic, Hasidic, and all the, we come from different backgrounds. We're so diverse. And we all have our own connection to God. We all have our standards. We have our values. They can be very personal. They can be very private. But we have our own connection with God. And when you're out in the world, very, very often, you're going to find yourself confronted with challenges. And they're going to challenge you to the core. And sometimes you're going to feel, well, maybe I should let go. Maybe this time I'll go to the restaurant that's not kosher. Or maybe, I'll, maybe, I, won't, maybe I won't make it home in time to light the candles for Shabbos. But what I've learned is that when you stick to your values and you stick to your standards, not only will it not hold you back, it will propel you. It'll propel you to your success. And when people see that you are committed to your values, guess what? They won't let you let go even if you want to because everybody wants someone to look up to. And when they see that you have your values, they see you have what connects you to God, deep down they respect it and they want to continue looking up to you. And I have so many stories to share of how 
from out of left field, I would get feedback from someone who was inspired by something that I did, and I had no idea. I had no idea. And things that I thought would hold me back and keep me from success, it was just the opposite. Wow, uh, there was so much in that. Um, I I want to say that I deeply related to to what you said about sticking to your principles. Um, you know, I have a couple of coworkers from the firm on the call, and and I think all of us know uh, what Friday night looks like and what it means to race the clock every Friday, no matter what, uh, in the name of sticking to your principles. And I I couldn't agree more that that people watch and they never forget what you do. And there's not a time where they're like, she didn't hand in that assignment because she was trying to stick to her principles. So thank you for giving that light. Um, I wanna double click on your family for a second. Um, I thought it was so interesting the way that you articulated that in the campaign, your dreams kind of, originally they lived out here, your professional dreams, but in the campaign, they had to collide with your family. And you highlighted that your family was supportive, your kids campaigned for you. I know you talked at my firm about how they went door to door because you didn't necessarily want your, your picture on flyers uh, in the name of modesty. Um, but I want you to kind of lift the hood on that. Like, what did this mean for your husband? You made that funny comment about him saying, we'll have good health insurance in the SOCA. And I can imagine that this was really a world change for him. This was a paradigm shift. He studied Torah all the time. Um, and so I want to talk about what that really meant for your family. And is it like something that you feel that deeply understand? Is it a joke? Are they like, oh, this is her thing? What, what did it really mean? And I'm actually going to tie this with a question that came in from the audience, which is really, I'm going to read it verbatim because I think, I should read it. Um, how were you able to be a mother, raise your kids, make dinner, do laundry, and at the same time study for exams or show up litigation? How did you divide your time and what did that mean for your family? Okay, so that's a real loaded question. How I got through law school studying and, and, and going to work and all that. First of all, I will say I did have help with the house. House cleaning help is very important. Nobody go out there and be a martyr. My mother always said, Ruchi, you will not be, you won't get a gold monument for not having help in the house. Get yourself less shoes and less wigs, but you get help in the house. So that's that's number one. You have to have the help that you need. And then in terms of, I didn't go to Hanukkah parties when I was studying. I didn't go out shopping. Everything was ordered. That was the years before we had online shopping. Everything was catalogs. And time is like money. You have to just learn how to spend it. So I was working very hard, but I was working towards a goal that meant so much to me. So I was able to do that. Um, dinner, if, it, if, it, if the recipe takes more than 20 minutes, it's not happening. So I cook quick, fast dinners. Um, the big elaborate dinners, that will be for the holidays, but not for every day. And I have a freezer. I have a microwave oven. I have all these little gadgets that make life easier. So that's, that's how I manage with, with the housework, with the cooking and with the cleaning and with the studying. In terms of my family and what it meant for them, now we're going to fast forward, right? Out of school, many years. And in the, in the early years, it was hard for my children. When they were little boys and they were going to school, the kids would ask them questions. And I taught my kids that only do what's right. And if you do what's right, you don't have to hide it. So it wasn't the secret that I was going to college or going to law school. The kids had a hard time. My husband had a lot of people giving him comments all the time. He would always ask him, how do you let your wife do this? And, um, but my husband's a very self-confident man. He's established, he's successful, he's a brilliant Talmudic scholar. So he has his own confidence and his own successes. So he doesn't perceive me as a threat or a competition at all. If not for his God, not for his help and, and being at my right side all the time, I never could have succeeded. And the community got to know me over, over time. And what they did see was that I did, thank God, raise a nice Hasidic family. And despite all the people who predicted that I wouldn't be able to marry off my children, two weeks ago, I married off my youngest child. So we have 
thank God, six married children. And um, so the community, as well as my family, have embraced what I do. The community is extremely proud because don't forget, I ran for public office. So Barapak had to vote for me. Had they not voted for me, I wouldn't be a judge. So they made it happen. And Barapak understands that. They made history. So it was a collaborative. It was a combined event. It was a meshing of so much that was happening. And my husband had gone to so many rabbis to get their endorsement for my public office. And that was advertised all over. So the people saw that this is something that it's different. No one else is doing it. But who says it's not a good thing? So Borough Park made history, not just myself. My kids ran from public office, not just me. You, you, you had to see what it was like. My, my, my boys have the long, dark side curls, the pais. They wear the long black coats and the black hats and the dark beards. And they will be standing on the street corners. Vote for Freya, says my mama. Vote for Freya, it's my mother. They had my palm cards translated into Yiddish. They had a campaign jingle written in Yiddish. They they did not leave every stone. Not one stone was left unturned. They're they're the ones that made it happen. So it was an interesting it was an interesting concept because I grew into this position. It happens. I'm, I'm sharing with you in 30 minutes what happened over 30 years. So it's 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 really it, every time I think about it, I'm so grateful to God to Hashem that I had this opportunity and that I was able to feel God helping me every step of the way. Thank you for highlighting this as such an incredible journey and a journey that it sounds like you give a ton of credit to your partner for. I, I think that's an idea that really deserves to be highlighted that like none of us get to these things alone. Um, so I, I want to turn to the topic of women in Judaism, which you spoke about. And um, by the way, it's also really hard to, to believe that no dinner, you know, no, no plain dinner takes more than 20 minutes. Because when I did my research on you, there was an article of you in CBC, like putting eight challahs into the oven. Um, but it, it's interesting because in that article, you said yourself, God doesn't make mistakes. And you said it in this interview. And I think that's an incredible line. And what I meant, what I read that to mean is that the creator made you a woman and he imbued you with these dreams, which means that you were meant to actualize them as a woman. And I guess I would love for your perspective on what is the role of females in Judaism, you know, you mentioned that they are elevated, they are on a pedestal, and the folks in the audience, I think, have varying degrees of exposure to Judaism. And so I want you to give your perspective on that, you know, in a focused way, and also, um, I guess, explain how you brought that into being a judge and into the work you do every day. It's interesting because um, I was once interviewed by a very prominent um, Israeli radio show um, host. Her name is Rabbi Nechimima Mizrahi. And um, she interviewed me and she, it was at that point, it was Parsha Shoktim and it was for her weekly Parsha program. And she, at that time I was sitting in criminal court. And she said to me, Rufi, you sit in criminal court and you preside over the most horrible kinds of cases with the worst crimes committed. How do you manage not to take your work home with you? And I pondered. And I said, you know, Rabbi Nit, it's just the opposite. I don't bring my work home with me. I bring my home to work with me. The values that I grew up with, the values that I was taught, those principles of Judaism, the foundation of MS, truth, chesed, compassion, all those, all those and tzedakah, righteousness and charity, all those values that have been ingrained in me since I was a little girl and just grew up with is what helps me when I'm on the bench. And I always say I have the best job, the best seat in the house, because regardless of which courtroom I'm assigned to, when I sit down, above me are the words in God we trust. 
And that's what you see in every courtroom. And that always puts me into perspective. Now, in terms of the role of women in Judaism, that's an interesting question. Judaism is very specific in the role of women and in the role of men. We have 613 commandments. There are commandments that are for women and those that are for men. And I always say that for me, the best evidence that, that God elevates women is in Judaism. What determines your identity as a Jew is who your mother is. Your father could be a wonderful person. He could be the greatest guy ever. But if your mother is Jewish, then you are considered a Jew in term, under Judaism. And that means we, we, we're the ones that safeguard and transmit Judaism for all generations. And to me, that's a, a huge, incredible responsibility and an incredible position. It's just, I think that it, to me, it's just, it's just obvious. Many people don't really understand the concepts of how tradition carries itself out, how you have the mitzvot, and then you also have tradition. So in the Hasidic community, there's a concept in Hasidism that whatever is a mitzvah, a commandment, we do it above and beyond the call of duty. So any commandment that which, which can be fulfilled in one way, in the Hasidic community, it's going to be fulfilled in a much more profound way. So many people look at that and they say, oh, that's very restrictive. It seems to be very restrictive. It seems to be difficult on women. So from the outside or looking in, you don't necessarily see the beauty and the joy of Hasidism. But in terms of the bigger picture of Judaism, a lot of people don't understand that the concept of being a woman is just so empowering and so special. And I, I love to refer to the Eishas Chayel, the woman of valor that was written by Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, where he talks about the Jewish woman. And he, he praises her and says that she's, she's smart and she's, she's ambitious and she's running her business. She's up late at night. She's doing deals overseas. Her husband is a great guy too. Her kids are proud of her. So those, those are the values that I carry in me about Judaism. And this is the way I was brought up. I'm a product of my environment. So that's how I look at Judaism. And that's how I look at the role of women. To me, the fact that I've given the privilege of having children. I remember when I was in, in law school, we were learning about all the different cases about women's rights. I remember saying, you know, Every day that I gave birth was the most beautiful day of my life. And now that I could say I'm a grandmother, I just married up all my children. I say, where did the years go? How is, I mean, I can't even talk about how old my children are anymore. I have to start lying about their ages. My oldest son is about 33 years old. And my oldest grandchild is almost 12. And it's like, I say like, and I, and I feel so privileged that I was raised in this community that I was able to maximize my role as a Jewish woman and it didn't hold me back in terms of my profession. And I like to say I have a profession, not a career, because to me, the word career has this connotation that family's on the back burner and my family always comes first. Now, it doesn't mean that I didn't miss PTA once in a while or school production, but I have mother, a mother and my sisters and they all helped me out when I needed help if I, if I missed a performance. But I just feel that there's our, our culture, our religion is so rich and there's so much beauty in it. I was recently interviewed by Megan Kelly on her Today Show. And um, I remember when they said to me they want to come interview me and I was debating if I should do it, if I shouldn't do it. And then I figured, you know what? Maybe I should take this opportunity because if God sends it my way, there probably is a reason for it. And I remember telling them, you're going to come to my house. I'm going to have you come on a Friday. And I will have you come Erev Shabbos Hanukkah this time of year. And I want you to see how we're rushing like crazy. And I want you to see how my husband will light the menorah and I will light the Shabbos candles. And I want you to see how Judaism has a role for men and a role for women. And together we have this tapestry. And um, I think it was an eye opener for them. I said, and then if you have some time, I'll give you a piece of my potato pillow. But um, 
the Shabbos, the holidays, these are all to me very important. And if I wouldn't have that, I don't know if I'd be able to survive because the week is so busy, so intense that when I have this, like, okay, now it's, now we stop everything. The phones aren't ringing. Everything is quiet. Now it's time to connect again to God and with family. And, and that's what Judaism does. It, it, you know, puts things into perspective. It's like these traffic signals. If you want to get someplace quickly and you, you pass your red lights, you may get there quicker, but you may just find that you're going to crash. And that's what Judaism and the Torah does for us. We have those stop signs. We have those yellow lights. We have all these indicators telling us, be careful, watch out. Don't go this way, go that way. It's, it's kind of like the GPS to help you navigate. And, you know, for me, it was more challenging because I felt that I didn't have anyone that I could follow. So it was kind of hard, you know, finding that path, finding that way. But now, thank God, I have a lot of young interns that come and I give them the chance to come and spend time with me in court and let them ask their questions. And so let's try another question, if I didn't answer your question yet. Um, you did. Thank you. Uh, so there are a lot of actually interesting questions about the mixing of secular law and your Jewish convictions. And so I'll, I'll kind of ask about two themes. So one question that came in is, have you ever had to recuse yourself from a case because of your Hasidic background? And the other is, um, have you ever felt that you had to make a ruling that was potentially contradicting Torah law or even close to it? And how did you think about that? Okay. So to answer, the, they're kind of intertwined, both of these questions, because if they're ever is a case that I cannot um, sit on because of some ethical um, considerations. And we always have that. There always are reasons why a judge would have to recuse himself or herself if you're related to any of the litigants, if you work for a litigant or, or, or they worked for you, you have to recuse yourself. And if, if there would come a case in front of me where I felt that I couldn't, that I couldn't handle it without feeling contradicted, then I would recuse myself. Now, the times that I had to recuse myself have been when one party was a relative of mine or one party was someone who I knew from my community. But even though I offered to recuse myself, both the prosecutor and the defense said that they still wanted me to sit on the case. So I have to recuse myself and sometimes I'll say, no, we still want you on the case. I had to also recuse myself when a litigant came in front of me and um, he was an EMT. And because of my role in, in emergency medicine, I said, um, that litigant may be upset if I'm the judge. And I recuse myself. So yes, it happens. And it happens to all the judges that they have to recuse themselves. And this is New York City. There's so many judges around, so that never is a problem. But in terms of recusing myself because of who I am as a Hasidic woman, if it wasn't because I knew the person that was related to the person, no, I didn't feel I had to recuse myself. Like I said, the Torah values are what gives us strength, gives us focus. Every judge comes to the bench with their own background. That's why you want to vote for who you want to, or you're nominated for a certain reason. Everybody, nobody comes to the bench as an empty box. We're, we come with as who we are, and we hope that we bring with, with us to the bench something positive, understanding, compassion, and experience. And I'm very grateful for the experience that I have. And I, I love to read Perkei Avot, which is chapters of the fathers. There's so much in there about judges, about not being hasty, and about, you know, thinking of putting yourself on the other person's shoes. All these moral values that we have as a society comes from the Torah. Is How many times do you go to the courthouses and see engravings of Moses holding the Ten Commandments? I'm sitting now in Queen's Court, and in Queen's Supreme Court, there's a beautiful, beautiful rotunda, beautiful area where there's two paintings on the two office, uh, two ends of the staircase. And one is the founding fathers signing the constitution, and one is of Moses holding the 10 commandments. And I think that's that speaks volumes. And I'm, I was very proud to see those two paintings. 
I love that analogy. Um, and actually, I was thinking about, you know, how courts have had to function during COVID and during the lockdown. Um, and an interesting question came in from my friend Lena, uh, who's wondering whether, um, you know, in this particularly challenging year of 2020 and the extenuating circumstances in which we've had to operate, if you feel like um, you learned something particularly new or, or I guess, um, got clarity on something because of COVID and because of, of the lockdown. So the lockdown was very, very challenging. And um, what, I, what I did learn was how much we were able to, to benefit from technology, like we're doing right now on Zoom. I mean, we're doing now virtual trials, which I would never would have thought was possible. Technologically speaking, I think we advanced in the past, in the past half a year what would have normally taken about 10 to 15 years to advance. But I've also learned that there's something about being in the same room with somebody physically. As much as we benefited from technology, there is something about being face-to-face -face with somebody. So um, I've, I think that I've also, we've also learned to just appreciate what normal means. We know what normal means anymore, <laughs> but to know what it means and to, um, to be able to function. I mean, where I, where I live in Borough Park, there was a very, very strong, strong sentiment that we were gonna continue praying. We were not, you know, we, the neighborhood did not stop praying together. And things that were of real important religious significance, there was um, a lot of emphasis on we have to try to make this work. And um, so I've learned, I've learned a lot. Yes, I've learned how different communities have done different, have, have the, the COVID response has been very different in different communities. But I've seen that people that stick together and, and, and helped each other have pulled through. I also saw COVID through the eyes of emergency medicine, you know, being a, a first responder and getting calls and helping people that were that were going through COVID. It was it was really hard. It was really hard because going to help somebody was a risk. I mean, there were some calls that I went on and I found out afterwards that that person was positive for COVID. I had no idea. And um, again, I I think anytime we go through any difficult challenges. It's, it's just that faith in God that really helps us pull through. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for uh, your medical service to you and to all the other first responders and the healthcare workers that put themselves on the line uh, every day during the pandemic that didn't have a choice to stay home. I, I just wanted to make sure that, that, you know, that gets said in the context of this uh, conversation. I and I think the other interesting thing about the lockdown has been all of the TV that has come out. And uh, I know I watched Unorthodox during the lockdown. And uh, I know you have some interesting thoughts uh, and have been on the record with your reflections to the series. For those that haven't watched it, uh, it's essentially a story of a young woman who is portrayed as very unhappy in a Hasidic marriage. And she essentially leaves, you know, fakes a passport, leaves and goes to another country and then all of the community and the inner turmoil. And so I, I would love for you to share uh, your thoughts because I think the world we live in as Jews and as citizens is not separated from pop culture, uh, from TV culture. And I think it's important um, to set the record straight if we feel that those influences are not portraying to the world the way that, you know, we as Jews want to be seen. Well, the, movie, the movie was fiction. And fiction means it's, it's a story. It was supposed to be based on somebody's life experience, but it was far from her experience. And at the end of the day, it was, it was fiction. Uh, when I, I wasn't planning on seeing the movie because whenever I hear about movies that come out that denigrate the Hasidic community, I know it makes me upset. So why should I watch something that's going to make me upset? But when a good friend of mine who's from the, who's not observant, but very proudly Jewish, um, did see it, he 
called me up and he said, you know, my wife and I watched the movie and we couldn't help but just think, think to ourselves that this is so different from the life that you always described to us. And I said, you know what? If you have just one question, if you could just sum up just the most important question that you and your wife have after watching that movie, tell me that one question. And he says, okay, Ruchi, he says, we really want to know after watching that movie, are all Hasidic marriages loveless? And I said, no, that's not true at all. There's a lot of love in our life. Love between, you know, husband and wife and children, parents. That's, it's a very important component. We might not display it out in the open. We might not be affectionate publicly, but there is a lot of, of, of love in our life. And he kind of pushed me to watch the movie. And I was very upset. I, I, I was upset because I felt like somebody wants to make a movie for someone else's entertainment or whether it's just to, to, to make money or whatever the reason is, don't take my community and make a mockery out of us. And it wasn't authentic. Nothing in it was real. I mean, the story of how the guy goes around and how, and the escapades that he had. And I mean, your average Hasidic man doesn't live a life like that. Um, then how, and this, this poor girl, everything that could go wrong in anyone's life and our lives aren't perfect. Everybody has things that are challenging, but everything that could go wrong in someone's life goes wrong in her life from who her father is, who her mother is, how they marry her off, who the teacher is that teaches her about what marriage is all about. And when I married off my daughters, I also made sure that they were, that they had good I don't know if you call them instructors or counselors or we prepare them for marriage. You, you just don't throw the kids into getting married. And because our children grow up without having exposure to the opposite gender, unless of course it's family, but they aren't going to go out dating when they're ready to get married. That's when they introduce them to suitable um, partners. So the way that the marriage was portrayed, the way her life, you know, I'll tell you what I thought was very authentic in that movie. The bride's gown, the wedding gown was very authentic. It looked like a gown that I would get for my children. And also the scene um, when you have it's Passover and you see the kitchen, it's all covered with like tin aluminum foil. However, that is very authentic. That was a real proper kosher Passover kitchen. But everything else was exaggeration. It was, it was, I really took umbrage from that movie. I felt that it was so, it was such a bad portrayal of what Hasidic life is about, about how we marry off our children. The, the amount of prayer and the amount of emotion and the amount of, of, of what we put into marrying off our children is nothing what that movie was about. That's not to say that there aren't problems. We are human beings, just like any other community has diabetes or heart disease. It, that, that we're just like anybody else. But the value that we have on, on life, the value that we, that we put to marriage and relationships didn't come through accurately in that movie. So that was my take on it. And if anybody has questions that they want to ask me afterwards, you know, I'm more than happy to you know, share my, my, my Gmail address and answer questions because I think it's so important that the truth has to get out there. It's important that people know that we don't dress frumpy and um, we, we, we want to look good and um, we know where to buy nice clothes. And it, you might not get all this from the outside and you may sometimes feel uncomfortable asking someone the question. I mean, I was in law school. I tell my, 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 my classmates, I'm Hasidic. If you have any question, please ask me. Because you're not going to ask me, you're going to make assumptions. And most of the time, your assumptions are going to be wrong. So just ask me the question. And I would invite professors to my home so they could see what my home is like. And I think that's really very important. I think it's important that people have an accurate perception of what our life is about. And that's one of the reasons why I did agree to allow um, the filmmaker to do 93 Queen to give people a chance 
to see my home, to see my family, to see my husband and my children. So you get an accurate inside view of the Hasidic home. I, I know we definitely appreciate uh, your openness uh, in general tonight um, and you using your platform to really speak up and, and correct the record. I think that's very important. Um, I wanna be respectful of your time. Uh, and typically we would kind of do a closing, but I, I could think of no one better than you to actually um, to close this out and really leave us with uh, words of spirituality and and Jewish wisdom, I guess, is is how I would I would ask it. So I, I when I do end off, I'd love to end off with a a very famous Hasidic uh, story, and this is a story that relates to Reb Zisha of Anapol. Reb Zisha was one of the early early Hasidic rabbis, um, a student of you know the Baal Shem Tov, and Reb Zisha was on his deathbed and he's crying. And his disciples, his students are asking him, Rebbe, you're such a tzaddik, you're such a holy man, you're going to go straight to, to Gan Eden. Why, why are you crying? And Reb Zisha says, I'm not crying because up in heaven they're going to ask me, Zisha, why won't you like Moses? And I'm not crying because they're going to ask me, Zisha, why won't you like King David? I'm crying because they're going to ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like Zisha could have been? We don't know our potential. We don't know the strengths that we have that God has given us by creating us in his image. If I had a nickel for everybody who told me that the things that I wanted to do, I couldn't do, I would fill up many jars. You have to know that what it says in the, in the Mishnah, it says that the day is short and there's so much to do and everybody has to go and do something. But you don't have to finish the job. You don't have to finish the job, the Mishnah tells us. But you're not absolved from even trying. You have a dream. You have something that you want to do. You have to try. In the, in the Chumash, in the Bible, we read the story of when Moses was born in Egypt. And the terrible times that the Jews were going through under the cruel dictator Paro, who had decreed that all the Jewish baby boys have to be killed. So Moses' mother puts him in a little basket and sails him down the river. And who sees him? No one other than Batya, Paro's daughter. Now Paro's daughter went, comes to swim in the Nile and hears a baby cry and sees a basket but she's way too far from that basket. She knows she could never reach that basket, but what does she do? The Torah tells us she stretches out her hand and God does the rest. God made her arm long enough to reach that baby's basket and the rest is history. All you have to do is believe that God runs the world and lift your arms and try and you will be successful and achieve your goals without having to compromise any of your values and principles. Thank you. Uh, what a testament you are in this evening is to living authentically and to, I guess, endeavoring to do something, even if you're not the one uh, that is finishing it. And I think that's an amazing message for a year that's been as tough as 2020. Um, you have a lot of fans on this, uh, on this, this Zoom, so I don't want to close it uh, before we ask for your Gmail, if you don't mind sharing it. Sure. It, okay. We ask for the chat. Sure. So my, my private Gmail is my name. It's ruchifryer at gmail.com. That's R-U-C-H-I-E-F-R-E-I-E-R -E -E at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you so um, much. Thank you. You're welcome. For spending an evening thank with you. Us. Thank you for having me. Thank you.